Yes! What's up, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another session of Coffee and Martial Arts. Salute, 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 cheers. Oh, yeah, it's good coffee today. And a great guest, more a collaborator now. So uh, we have a great show today prepared for you with my good friend and coffee and martial arts collaborator, Maestro Sami Ibrahim. So um, before we get him here, let me just say that we are going live through our Facebook page, Master Frank Soto Kinetic Dragon. So please like the page, uh, follow us there, share, share this video, please like and share this video that really, really helps to promote our, uh, the arts, the program and everything. Remember, we do this for you. We do it for free. Uh, there are no, uh, you know, agenda here. We actually welcome everybody. If you want to be a part of this podcast and you want to be here and you think you have something to share, please let me know. And uh, I will be more than happy and honored to have you on the show. Okay. Um, okay. We're also going live to the International Hall of Fame page of Argentina. Yes, sir. They have their magazine. This is the cover of the September issue. The October one should be ready soon, very soon. Okay. So there you are. It's a nice group of martial artists doing their thing. So if you can follow them at, in their Facebook page at Internacional with a C because it's in Espanol, Hall of Fame. Yes, it's a mixture. Uh, uh, there, that should, um, you know, that will help us as well. Thank you. Okay, also, we are going live through our YouTube channel, the Kinetic Dragon channel. Yes, that's the brand. Kinetic Dragon is the brand. That's the channel. Please follow us there. Uh, we have uh, lots of video there for Campo for the Street and uh, Kinetica for your live. And we're also going live every Thursday. So if you want to follow there, us there, subscribe to the channel and like the video, of course, and click on the little bell so you get notified every time we go live. Okay, so let's bring in today. Uh, remember, before we get him here, uh, please leave your comment or ask a question. We are here for you. We love ask, uh, answering or trying to answer your question and sharing information with you guys, and we love your answers and your comments as well. So bring them on, okay? Make your comments ask you questions so today we have my good friend okay uh an excellent martial artist who is actually full of very interesting information because he has done a lot of research about the martial arts especially about kempo history and uh you know a lot of so much information there's always every time he comes into the show we always fall short with you know time and stuff because it's like ah we want to just share more because there's so much so i'm always very appreciative to have him in the podcast let's bring in maestro sami ibrahim what's up hello hello hola my friend how you doing sir wonderful how are you happy birthday thank you yes thank you thank you so much uh it was it was great yesterday so many people saying hello. I just want to say thank you for reminding me. Thank you, everybody, that uh, took your time and effort to say something on my Facebook page. Much appreciated, all of you. I haven't been able to answer all of you because there were like 400 messages. Like, <laughs> my God. But I'm reading all of them, and I will answer all of you. So just be patient, please, because I do appreciate I take my time to read them all and answer them all. So, Maestro Ibrahim. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing great. Looking forward Thank to you. this. I like the background there. That looks amazing. Thank you. It's my little workout area in my basement. Nice. Nice. Same here. Not the basement, but my little workout area. Okay. So uh, today we have a good show. But before we go there, we Maestro Diego Andres Salbucci want to say good afternoon, Master Fraternal Greetings from Buenos Aires. Saludos. Gracias. Okay, sir. So uh, today the subject is martial arts insights. So that's a pretty general 
um, you know, topic, but I know you have some very specific ideas of what you want to talk about today. So let's begin. Okay. So uh, the first thing I want to touch on before I forget, and it escapes my mind, is um, it's all, it's going to be, it's going to touch on a few topics, but the main thrust is when you're going to meet a martial arts instructor or a martial arts teacher, mm -hmm. traditionally, historically, and in modern times, there is a process of trust and respect that needs to be established. And it's a two-way street. It's about mutual respect and mutual trust. And once that is achieved, right, then you tend to hear, you, you tend to get uh, more details that you otherwise would not have been afforded. Okay. And some people are not even aware that this is a thing. You know, they just they just don't know coming from uh, if you if you've never studied the history of the different martial arts and stuff, it, it, it can be uh, a shock. You mean like I, I just pay my money and he doesn't give me all you know, he doesn't give me everything like no, he, he doesn't. Um, and so let's let's just take it his, from a historical point real quick. Um, okay. I'll, I'll just use the Chinese as an example, but this applies to all the martial arts in all the countries. Um, when you actually really any interaction with people in general, right, uh, even friendships are like this. You know, when you meet somebody, you can't expect them to immediately divulge every detail of their of their life and the background of what they do. And in the martial arts, especially um, back when the martial arts were treated as uh, military secrets or when they are treated as uh, matters of life and death for the tr for the clan, you know, clan survival. Um, these things were, were even more secretive. So they developed a three tier system. Right. And this is just one way. There's multiple ways to break it down. But one way to think of it is students who are at the lowest level of trust. They they've been accepted as students. They've come in. They've interacted with the teacher. But just like what you would expect if you went to a martial arts school and you asked them on their first day, you know, what is Kempo or what is Karate or what is Judo? You know, don't expect them to give you the complete and total historical breakdown of every detail of every senior master of all the the ins and outs and all the skeletons in the closet and all that, you're not going to get that, right? You're only going to get a very general um, level of uh, explanation right? because the teacher doesn't know you yet. He doesn't right. know what your character is. He doesn't know whether he can trust you or not. We don't even know if you're going to stay in the yard or if you're going to leave, right? right? So it is imperative at that level that you conduct yourself a certain way, which we'll get into. And this is about how to develop respect with your teacher, right? The second level is the level of a disciple. You have finally been accepted as a disciple. From student to disciple, your your closeness to the teacher is uh, is increased. And so you're going to get more details. You're going to get more historical details. And you're going to get more technicalities of the art, right? The, you, you would be surprised how many times the, the surface level of a martial art is, um, how to put it, not so much watered down, but um, it's just what I said. It's a surface level. It's a surface level knowledge. But then when you attain the level of disciple, suddenly your teacher is teaching you meanings behind movements that you, you know, you, you'd been doing for years, but you didn't know that that it had, uh, you know, for example, a really good application, a really good martial application to a movement, um, perhaps uh, with lethal consequences. You know, you might get that as a disciple, you know. And then if you if you prove that you have further potential and you've earned your teacher's trust, then you enter into what we call the closed door relationship or a closed door disciple. And at that level, you are being considered for or at least um, I don't want to say the hair because not everybody wants a, a, a lineage hair, but um, you'll be at least considered as somebody that he wants to continue his leg or she wants to continue the legacy of that martial art. So okay. when this teacher dies, he wants you to have the full plethora of the knowledge so that you can pass it on to other generations. And so it doesn't dilute. Right. right. So that person is going to get a whole nother level of history, a whole nother level of detail, a whole nother level of technicalities. You might find that there is a martial art hidden within your martial art. OK. Uh, and this group will be a very small group, right? Yes. It just constantly gets smaller. And um, the, we're, we're talking about history here, right? About the way it was. Yes. So didn't this influence that you were like a member of the family or a blood uh, out of the bloodline and stuff like that? 
now we're now you're touching on stuff that's actually directly in my book and uh and yeah you're you're absolutely right so um actually broke this down really good and i i can't i'm gonna kick myself because i'm not gonna sound as good when i verbalize it um but <coughs> excuse me so it, let's take a clan for example so let's just say you're i don't know part of the shen clan right so if okay. you're and I don't mean Shen Tai Chi. I'm just picking a Chinese name here. Right, so you're, right. It you're, doesn't matter. You're, you're part of the Shen clan. You're part of the oh, Abraham clan. Right. That that person, right, that is in charge of the system, the martial knowledge of the system, the one who has, you could say, the master, the grand master, whatever you want to, whatever title of prestige you want to honor him with. He's going to teach his immediate family members, right, sons, possibly even daughters, um, and depending on how many of those he has, right, uh, might be like cousins and nephews and other re just really close uh, first cousins. It, it, they will actually get taught. Um, I hate to put it like this, but uh, bear with me because I, I know that supremacy is an illusion, but he's going to teach them the supreme system, right? Meaning supreme, supreme to what? Supreme to the next level down. So the next level are going to be guys that work for the family, right? And more distant relatives, so right? We could say that there are like um, it's divided into levels. Let's say three levels because of what you mentioned, right? Yes. So you have the the beginners or the or the student, then the disciple, then the closed door. So you have those. It's not just groups, but it's also levels of teaching and knowledge, right? Right. So I mean, there's a reason why I pick Shen. So I'm 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 going to actually go ahead and pick on the Shen Shen guys right now, the actual Shen clan, right? So for um, and I love you guys, so you know, very respect, all honor and respect to the yes. Shen family Tai Chi. But Shen Village was famous, was famous for their martial arts practitioners. People wanted to go to Shen Village and hire them to be caravan guards because they were excellent. They had a, a very excellent developed spear system, right? Um, they used that spear like um, what you might say, like a like sticky spear, right? Like when you connect and you can stay and, and stay connected and work your way in, right? That was uh, something new that wasn't as popular, right? And they were known for it, right? Okay. So money, right, to make a living, uh, it, it behooved the Shen villagers to keep it within the village, right? Because if that got out, right, to other villages, then they would become famous for that and then they would lose business, right? So in, and the thing about China is you have a lot of uh, times when you just enter a famine, right? So it's very, you know, if you could get a good job, um, let, let me put it like this. Sometimes in China, it was considered reasonable to cut off your private parts if you were a male, right? right. Both of them, right? So that you could become a eunuch just so yeah. you could have money to eat and provide for your family, right? Wow. So people would willingly, even though it's like, I think the odds were 50% survival rate, you would go up on this table and they would tie you down and they would, you know, you'd sign, of course, a release and then they would remove your stuff and then you would transform, you know, you would grow because the, the estrogen level and, and everything testosterone level would go crazy and then you'd become a eunuch, but eunuchs got paid well, right? So, I mean, that's the level of starvation that was there for people to consider that a reasonable thing to do, right? right. In perspective. Right. So letting the secrets of your martial art leak out was not something you wanted to do. So the villagers who are not necessarily blood relatives of the master are going to get taught. I guess you could say the they're going to get taught the martial art of that master, but it's going to be uh, without certain details. OK, because it meant survival. Right um, now, uh, they would be taught in, like, say, a public uh, courtyard, for example, right outside. And if somebody um, and the servants were allowed, you know, servants because they lived in the village. So if you're a servant, but you're not a member of the family, you, you might get taught a little bit. Right. I know the story of Yang spying on them and stuff. Let's put the myth aside for a second. So anyway, um, so when the court guys come in, excuse me, when somebody from another village comes in, the, there's always lookouts and the lookouts see the person coming in and then they revert to uh, they don't want to just stop doing martial arts because that would look suspicious, too. Right. So they'll just continue. But they'll only perform like a form without with all the angles wrong. Sometimes the angles reverse. Sometimes the techniques are reversed. Right. So you're actually I know there's been a, a few comedic skits about training someone in Kung Fu incorrectly. You know, uh, it, it's kind of like that. So anybody who's spying is going to get the wrong information. All right. Okay. The next level is the actual blood family, because 
within a village, you could have a feud. And if the villagers feud, right, you want your family to maintain the advantage, right? Then within your family, if there's a feud between family members, then you want your closer bloodline, right? Your more immediate family to be, to have a superior level of martial knowledge to the guys that you've trained previously, right? The guys below them on the rung below them so that you always maintain the advantage. That's why they used to say, you know, the master always saves a few moves that he keeps to himself and he only passes them on like right before he dies. Right. right. That's where that, that legend comes from. So how is it that you, how do you come into a martial art and you, how do you get access to the real history? How do you get access to, um, to become an indoor disciple, you know, and is that kind of thing still prevalent in modern times? Right. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll leave that to you to, to um, I've been talking endlessly, please, Frank. Um, well, I, I have a story, you know, I just, I just remember something that my instructor told me years ago. Um, my Kempo instructor, Mr. Tatum, I should say, uh, I hope I'm not disclosing anything, but it, it was an interesting story because there's, there's this video that uh, his first video Walls of Defense. I don't know if you've seen it, where he's at the castle in, in the coast of yeah. France and in, in the Jersey Island. Uh, and at the beginning of the, the video, he's doing some type of kata, but you see him doing the kata up here. If you see the hands, he's using doing the hands up here, not down here, right? Now, if you know Kemp and you're a black belt or you're familiar with the art, you're going to understand what he's doing. But if not, you're just going to see a bunch of fancy moves. So I asked him once, I remember, I said, why are you doing that that way? And he said, well, uh, this was a way to hide the moves back in the day. What uh, he said, what Mr. Parker did, he said, he would put the arms up and moving and doing the, the application of the moves up here. So you couldn't see exactly what was going on instead of doing it down at the level it should be done. Right. So. I think it's interesting. You know, it was just for me, it was an interesting thought. I was like, oh, cool, interesting, right? It, it, it gives spice and value to what you're learning, right? I, was, I really appreciated that story uh, and, and many others. But it, it touches a point here, right? Um, that secrecy that you're talking about, right? It's still there. Now, one of the other stories that I remember, and this has been told by a lot of Kempo seniors and, and, and Kempo practitioners who were there back in the 70s or 60s, uh, is that uh, at Parker Studios, whether it was Pasadena or, or uh, West LA, they had, uh, especially, in, I think it was in the West LA one, they had private rooms. That's why it's called private lessons. So you will get your private lesson in a room, or they had curtains dividing the mat, the tatami, the, the, the mat area. So you couldn't see what the other student was doing, especially if he was in a higher level. So that was a practice that was done, uh, what, 50, 60 years ago? It wasn't that long ago. And I guess some other martial artists still do it that way. And even so, you have a curriculum, right? You have to learn this, this, and that. Uh, it was, there was a veil. And there's actually a black belt uh, issue uh, from the, I think it was late 70s, where you see Mr. Tatum uh, doing a strike. And, and the title of that article or that magazine on the cover says, Lifting the Veil of Kempo. Right? I don't know if you remember that one. I do. I remember. So, so it's, it, it's, it all makes, it, it makes sense, right? I mean, it's like, wow. Wow. Uh, but before we continue, let me just say hello. We have some people saying hello here. Miyagi Argentina, big hug, big brothers, dear brothers from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Saludos, gracias. Okay. Uh, Read one, Mauser, is that okay? Did I say that okay? Greetings, Mr. Soto and Mr. Abraham, Cape Town, South Africa. Nice. Thank you. Love it. Sifu Ernesto Colbert and saludos, maestros. Big hug from the heart. Salud, Sifu, from Argentina. Saludos. Ah, my friend Desmond Vidal. Peace and greetings to you both. How did a teacher uh, uh, able to distinguish between a student's ego to be able to move the students through the three levels? That's a good question. What are you, going, what are you getting there? <clears throat> Looking forward to answering that one. Uh, he says, greeting, Master Ibrahim, do you think in 2021 the secrets should still be concealed from students? Uh, that's another good question. Thank you, sir. 
Uh, and let's see, Master Kurt Joblin. Hello, Master Kurt Joblin from Arizona. Hello, sir. Thank you. Take care, senor. Okay, so which um, you want to answer a question? All right, I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to answer them all at once. Okay, so be, I'm gonna but pause first. We can look at this a different way. Okay, instead of using the word secrets. We can look at it from the perspective of natural social interaction. You generally, you, if you're coming into a subject, right, let's say chemistry, mathematics, whatever. If the teacher immediately gives you the most advanced stuff, I mean, I'll use math because math is may as well be secret to me. Um, if, if, you, uh, if you come into a, to a math professor and, you know, you barely know how to add and subtract and you want to solve one of those equations the really smart guys write on the windows um in beautiful minds right like you know how do you 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 couldn't it wouldn't make any sense to you even if a teacher wanted to teach you to you right because it's not like these masters i mean they love the highest form of their art right they they love to share they would love to just yes i want to i want to give you the 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 pinnacle of what i have right but you're gonna look at me like i'm either you know bat poop crazy or you're going to just not it's going to go right over your head you're not even going to see the value of it right what the heck are you talking about right right and there's going to be so many and also you're going to be skeptical too because you you haven't yet had the experiences right uh it's kind of like what we talked about with like fighting multiple opponents or things like that where people are just like that's impossible that's just that's an unrealistic movie stuff you know it's the, the same kind of thing like people are just not going to get it that's on one level. So you really got to develop trust and they got to go through certain levels of experience or stages of learning and progression anyway. So it's not so much that you have to use the word secret at all. You could say that um, the, the people who initially meet the master and get accepted as students have to go through a set of experiences, right? And have to earn a certain level of trust within that uh, community before right. they can get more advanced material. And then once they have a firm foundation in that material and they show the potential to be able to even utilize the more advanced material, then they can be they can move into that indoor disciple level. Right. Um, and again, with uh, when we're talking about ancient times, we're talking about the survival of a clan and stuff like that. But okay. I got to tell you, to answer your question on a straightforward manner. Yes, I do believe that. And I didn't for a very long time. I didn't believe in secrets. In fact, I would get really pissed off. If I thought for a second that a particular master was keeping a secret or had a secret system, I would get... go ahead. No, interesting. I, I feel yeah. the same way. Yeah. I didn't believe in secrets for a long, long time. And now I think they're necessary. Yeah. When I, I walked into a, a, I shouldn't, I shouldn't call this. I'm not going to name who this person is. But I walked into a Salat school when I was a kid. I was brought there by a friend of mine who knew that guru. And uh, this is, you know, now you see I love Silat, right? But back then, I mean, I didn't know what Silat was, right? right. And I came in, I had um, a military shirt on because I was, uh, at the time, uh, I was being, a, I was associating with a different branch of the military. Okay. Uh, long story. Anyway, right. so I walk in, he sees my shirt, and because of the origins of his art and his religious beliefs, he was about to start lying to me about the art, Right. He was about to teach me a completely what he thought was a completely ineffective system. Right. Just take my money and teach me garbage. Basically, that's what he was getting ready to do until I started speaking his language. Right. And then all of a sudden he was like, oh, I thought you were one of these type of people. But now that I know you're one of us, you know, now I can tell you, you no, know, actually, we don't even teach those guys. We just teach them. And he named some other martial art that he felt was ineffective. And he's like, for it, then, you know, we teach you guys the real secrets. I was so offended that I basically asked to cross hands with him and in crossing hands with him, actually he defeated me, but I didn't know it. Right. See, cause he dropped and scissored uh, my ankle and kneecap, but he didn't apply pressure. He just positioned himself. And since I was over him with my hand ready to throw a, a punch down at him, I felt like I had the advantage and I walked away feeling very arrogant. Right now I never went back to that guy. Right. I did train with one of his students for a while. I used to come up to one of the schools that I used to teach at and we used to spar and stuff. But that teacher, I always thought negatively about him because I'm like, you know, who, who still keeps secrets that to me, I thought it was racist, you know? Right. Um, and uh, it just, it bothered me on, on that level. 
years and years of life experience later, I get it. I do. I get it. Because I see what happens when a guy comes into a school and you start giving him everything before he proves that he's trustworthy. Then he runs off and either copyrights the names of your techniques or he runs off and he just opens up his own thing, forms his own martial art. Right. But he's using all of your material, doesn't give you any credit for it. Right. And then because his morals are in question, next thing you know, you find out he's touching little kids or something crazy like that. Right. Now, granted, if any of my students well, ever did something like that, yeah, I would, and, you know, but you and, get the idea. And also, if you see it um, in companies or in the business world, you have this confidentiality agreements and all that type of stuff It's the same thing. Right. I mean, you have you have to have your your trade secrets. Right? right. And you want to protect them because it gives you an advantage. So why in the hell should the martial arts be different? Yeah. Look, I, I'm one of those people that I do believe in teaching people for free, especially when they can't afford it. Sure. So one of my teachers taught me for free, although he always told me to charge an arm and a leg um, when it came time for me to teach. But he often taught me for free. And uh, and, it, you know, but you can't do that for a lot of people. Right. Because people won't value it. But that's that's a different subject. So should you have secrets? Well, number one, you have to because people aren't ready for the more advanced material. Number two, you have to have um, what I call a waiting period to get to know somebody on a right. social level and just to see, you know, are they going to stick with the art or not? Right. Because it doesn't make sense to give them a bunch of stuff and then have them run off to this instructor. You take a few more pieces here, take a few more pieces there. And suddenly they just show up one day like I am Grandmaster so and so from this made up art. And then here's the crazy thing, right? We talk about this a lot with a made-up lineage, right? Because it's, it's so easy to fabricate a lineage because there's a sort of a, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, when you, you let people get away with stuff that you're not supposed to let them get away with. There's a lot of that. Like there's a apathetic attitude towards uh, historical information. People are like, well, it's just a story, but I like it so much. I'm going to keep telling it. Right. Like I, I'm, you know, that's my pet peeve. Right. I'm like, no, where are the facts? Where's the, where's the actual, you know, the actual knowledge. So anyway, back to how do you actually go to these? First of all, how do you find these guys? Right. And then how do you show them proper respect? And what are things that you can do that'll get you kicked out? Will it keep you at the student level or keep you from attaining, um, the higher levels of information. So I want to start by asking you, uh, Master Soto, what what can a student do to show you that they are sincere, that they really want to learn, and that um, that they are going to be loyal to the art, they are going to value what you teach, and that you can trust them? What do you look for, and do you have any kind of test that you do at the beginning? Well, before we go there, let me just say, Salvador Sanavia, felicidades, Master Frank, por su cumpleaños. Gracias. Saludos, maestro. Muy amable. Okay. Um, first of all, I agree with you with the progression part. It has to be progressive, right? And you have to earn or, or, or like, you know, we, sh we hear a lot, pay your dues, right? You, you have to earn uh, the knowledge. That's why there are ranking systems and, and so forth, right? So it's basically uh, uh, meritocracy, right? So it's, it's upon your merits, upon what you earn. <clears throat> um, now, before I didn't have that, that, I was more like I will teach anybody, especially when you start teaching and you're very enthusiastic and passionate about the art, you just want to teach, right? You want to have students and you're grateful, so grateful that anybody wants to learn from you and wants to learn this art or this thing that you love and you share is, <clears throat> and you just start sharing but then after a while, you started getting screwed by some individuals, right? You started getting, it's life, right? It is life. Some people that just uses the knowledge that you gave them in a bad way or don't give you credit. And you're like, dude, at least just, you know, be grateful. And they leave and they start bad mouthing you and stuff like that, right? Normal stuff. I mean, it is human interaction things that happens, right? And that's when you start being like, okay, well, I'm going to talk about myself. That's when I, okay, maybe I'm not doing it right. Maybe I shouldn't trust everybody, right? 
So <clears throat> I think one of the things is time, like you just said. <clears throat> if the person sticks to it for like a year or two years or four years or, you know, puts the time and effort to get a black belt, that's when I believe the black belt has a value. <clears throat> when you earn the thing, you, you learn all the material that it was taught at school, you were there for three, four, five, six years, uh, you put up with, you know, classes and sparring and uh, dumbing up and, you know, being down in a stance for like half an hour or whatever crazy thing will the instructor will think of to make <laughs> them suffer and pay, you know. And, of course, it's all to build the student, right? I mean, there's always a purpose behind it. It's not just because you just want to be mean or anything like that. But that's one filter right there. The other filter that I had was the advanced class, which is a very Kempo oriented activity, right? There's an advanced class for students up to at least green belt or brown belt and up, right? And in that advanced class, you're going to hit each other harder, right? So there's, there's a risk value and there are some, um, you know, you need to put up with the pain, basically. Right. Because, well, you're learning how to fight and you're learning how to defend yourself. So you will get hit, not injured. But yes, there will be pain. And the, the beginner student shouldn't go through that. At least not at the beginning. Right. Eh, not at the same level as an advanced. student. Yes, definitely. Yeah. OK. Uh, yes, I do believe in hard training for sure. I'm definitely old school there. But uh, there are, like you said, progression. Right. So. That's when, what I did back then. I didn't have a system, right? Now, I'm older and I'm grumpier, basically. Yes, definitely. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm nicer to people. I'm way more tolerant. I don't judge. But if I don't see an effort from the, from the student side, I won't put an effort either. I know it sounds bad. I know it sounds you know, arrogant, something, but it, it's also life. An instructor will get burned out eventually. We'll get tired of this attitude. It's like, okay, so you just want a course of self-defense? Well, I'll teach you a little course of self-defense. You learn to defend yourself and get on with your life, right? But if you want to learn the art, if you want to learn this ancient wisdom, because that's what it is, an ancient wisdom, and you don't respect what's sacred to me because it is sacred to me right because i put it there for me martial arts it's a sacred thing because i put it there not because of any mumbo jumbo anything i put it there right it's sacred for my life it's sacred for my understanding right so if you want me to share that sacred knowledge i will make sure that you share it and appreciate what I'm giving to you. How? Well, there are different ways. First of all, what I will look for a person is to for them to have a good heart. The rest, I can give it to them. Right? I can teach you how to move. I can teach you how to kick and punch. I can teach you how to manipulate somebody, whatever, the technique, because, well, I'm an instructor and, and I'm good at it. You know, I've I've been doing this for many, many years. I think I can make you move, right? I'm sure of it. But to change who you are, your essence, no, I cannot do that. That would be wishful and stupid thinking. You think that way when you're young, like when you're going to get married and you, oh, no, like um, I will change her. Right? She <laughs> Don't remind be, me. <laughs> yeah, that's, well, that's what it is, right? We are uh, delusional that way, right? Okay, we have some people saying hello. Desmond Vidal says, Master Ibrahim, thank you for a fantastic, insightful answer. Nice. Thank you. Oh, we have another familiar face here. Axel, greetings, Frank and Sammy. Great background. Ah, nice. Okay, saludos. So, uh, that being said, I believe people will have to earn things. And, and I say it in a good way. And I'm, this is also one thing I just want to touch before I, I, I give you, you know, the word. Um, 
it's also important for the student. See, if you have an advanced student who has earned his or her way up to that, you know, close circle, up to that level of trust and, and, and commitment, and if you treat that person, if you treat the beginner the same way, that advanced student will feel neglected or unappreciated. Will say, okay, I have put this time and effort into this, respecting your rules, respecting your calls, waiting for your time, you know, the student saying the instructor. And you as an instructor are not respecting this and you're giving away rank, for example, or advanced knowledge that will make the student pissed and rightfully so. So that's also another important thing to mention. That's why it's important to have that progression, okay? And it's not because that advanced student is better. No, it's because he or she has put the time and the effort and has respected all of your rules that you put and they expect the same treatment to everybody else, right? Right. Good. That's very insightful. Thank you for for answering. I, I'll just uh, I'm going to touch on a couple of things that I've seen historically or I've I've heard about historically, right? And that is, uh, for example, the the old tea ceremony, right? So they used to say that uh, the teacher, you know, the, the person would bring out the tea, the student would bring out tea for the teacher. Right. Which is this is normally what you would do for an elder in that culture anywhere in several cultures. You know, so it's not like the teacher is going to pour you. The master is going to pour you tea. You're going to pour the tea for the master anyway. Right. Or, you know, if you're at a restaurant or whatever and somebody, the, the waiter or whatever, the servant's going to come and pour the tea. But the test is. Who's going to drink first. Right. So the master waits to see if out of respect, the student will wait until the master starts to sip the tea, then they will proceed, right? Same thing with meals, right? So uh, the, the meals get placed in front of everybody, say the teacher is talking to you right before the food comes out, right? And then the food gets put in there. If you just start eating before the master has touched his food, in a way you're saying the food is more important than the conversation we're having, right? So in that sense, you would don't touch your food, don't even touch the fork or the you wait until the teacher starts to eat and then you can start to eat. Right. And the teacher looks for little things like that, you know, and this is some of the traditional things, you know, I'm not saying that people in modern times do it, although I, my mind will automatically pick it up. I will notice I will take people to restaurants, you know, and I will see it how they behave, tell you about right? the person. Yes. Right. So you have that. And then one of the things, another one of the common tests was to uh, on the first day and, and Professor Chow was famous for this, just disrespect the person coming to learn from you, just disrespect him and see if they have a short temper if they're going to lose their temper or get really upset. Um, and if they do, then you know that person is short-tempered and it's a risk to teach them, right? Um, yes, okay, like uh, sometimes you end up teaching somebody um, like you're obligated to. Or to just give you an example, right? Like if I'm teaching a little kid because they're my kid, right? Well, okay, I have to instill patience in them. I have to train that, right? Um, I have to I have to train um, skills of observation into somebody. Right. Like because you're building them from scratch. But if somebody comes to you, they're already an adult. Right. Or, you know, a young adult and they want lessons. A lot of their character and their habits have already been established. So at that point, if you you know, can you can you fix them? Oh, you can. You can do what the military does and basically brainwash somebody. Right. Um, but I mean, you'll probably get sued if you try to do it. Right. I, I always think about that. Um, what is that movie with the guy with the white mask? Um, and they, you know, they do the Viva Revolution, the V. Uh, v for Vendetta? Yeah, yeah, V for, thank you. He, where he shaves the woman's head and he locks her up, right? There's a great way to build character, right? Oh, you want to study with me? Let me let me put you in a prison for a while so you can develop character. So we're not going to do it to that extreme, but that's there's ways to do it. But you as a teacher shouldn't have to. The guy's coming to you to learn. You shouldn't have to be the moral, you know, I got to, I got to train you in manners. I got to train you in patience. I got to, you know, these are things that you should already have to be right. worthy of learning something that is capable of taking someone's life, you know, and, and by the way, hold on, hold on. Like, 
Oh, and that's that's just just touch something very important. Sorry that I interrupt you. It's is you're just not learning, you know, how to write something or I mean, there's something very important about this. You're learning how to defend yourself, but you're also learning you in in foundation. You're learning how to take some personal life. And that's it's like learning how to shoot. Right. It's the same thing. People don't treat it that way, but they should. Sorry that I had to interrupt. Please. No, I, I, I agree with you. And again, actually, funny, uh, if my masters, all of them in the past, had followed those rules with me, I would have never learned martial arts because I was uh, I was an asshole. Oh and, uh, gotcha. and, and, and I mean, it's truthfully I have and I still have a ridiculously short temper. Now, in my mind, of course, it's a really long fuse. It just, it just that I, I'm holding everything in the past, right? So it's just, you know, from the moment I was born till now, every bad thing that's ever happened to me has shortened that fuse. But people don't see it that way. They're just like, man, you, you can go from like zero to a hundred in a heartbeat. Okay. So anyway, by my own standards, I needed more patience and I would have been a better martial artist if I had that, you know, I'm just lucky. Like my, most of my teachers, I, to be honest with you, I did get kicked out by one teacher who thought I was evil, but most of my teachers, um, did uh sam you have evil spirit no train here anymore yeah I, I had that like whole kung fu movie scene um you know but it made me reflect and it was just because i embarrassed some other master at a public demonstration because he was teaching people uh he was uh w when you pull that picture down of that handsome man all right <laughs> forgot i gave you those aha that's the evil man right there <laughs> well, I, I was a lot more attractive back in those days. Um, but uh, so this guy in the public demonstration, he he's uh, demonstrating for these school teachers. And I was invited by a school teacher um, to go attend this guy's seminar. Right. But I wasn't really supposed to be there because I'm not faculty or a student. It's just that I used to train that teacher. So he invited me to come. So I'm just watching and I'm trying to keep my mouth shut, you know. And this guy's like waving his hands over the top of someone's head and talking about manipulating their aura. And he's doing a lot of hokey stuff. And one of the teachers asked him, how do you break up a fight between two people, right? So if two students are fighting or something, you know, what do you recommend to break up the fight? And he taught to step right in the middle of the two people fighting and try to control someone's arm. And I was like, wow, you know, the moment you touch my arm, if I was fighting as a student, I'm going to haul off and slug you on accident, even if I don't want to, right? Because I'm in the midst of fighting. I wouldn't step in front of them. So being that I was young and full of, you know, what I call piss and vinegar, I... I asked him a question, sort of, but it was kind of rude. I said, wouldn't it be better if, you know, and then I think I said, uh, if you went up behind one of them and uh, pressed on their medulla oblongata at an upward angle, right? Pow, right? Wouldn't that, wouldn't that make, uh, you know, because if you do that, right, the person's arms fly out and, and, you know, so if they're strangling somebody, you come up behind them and you press the spot under the ear at an upward angle while condensing the head, wham, usually the arms fly out, the person pops up, right? Usually. So actually I've had that have a completely different effect in a fight where a guy went into a seizure. So don't play around with that stuff. Um, I thought it wasn't working. <laughs> I jammed my finger into this guy's medulla oblongata. He was on top of me in the mouth and I was like, man, it's not working. And I pull out and then he has a seizure. So, uh, Yeah. I always joke it was the right time of day and the moon was just right. And I accidentally found the Dimock point. Right. But, um, but yeah, so what a weird guy actually dumped water on him. Cause I thought that might help him come out of the seizure. And then I just told everybody I wasn't there and I left. It was a block party. So anyway, um, <laughs> adventures as a kid, uh, right. where was I? Um, <laughs> what were we talking about? Uh, the guy with the aura moves and all that. Oh yeah. So anyway, after I demonstrated that the man got really upset and he said, I've been teaching martial arts for 40 years and da da da. And he just, you know, his face turned really red. Cause, oh, cause he asked me to come up and demonstrate. And then I did it on him. And then, uh, so that's, that's what set him off. And then, uh, so then after I left, I actually walked out at that point. I didn't even want to hear his rant. And, uh, the teachers later at the end of the seminar came up to me and they're like, thank you for for, you know, that guy was really full of himself. And I got a lot of compliments from the teachers that were watching this guy. Um, but my master found out and then I got I got, uh, you know, I got the whole evil spirit lecture. So um, but hey, you know what? I get it from his cultural perspective. That was a really disrespectful thing. And I should be more humble. And the guy was older and a senior. So even if what he's doing is a bunch of hokey pokey nonsense, I should probably not 
have embarrassed him publicly, you know? So that was, I can, I understand. Actually, that guy eventually took me back um, later and, um, and, you know, so God rest his soul. He you know, passed away a while ago. Um, but all right. So back to this thing about earning respect and showing respect and things like that. You know, if you come to a martial arts teacher and I'm just, just talking to you guys, frankly, like I would, if you were in my living room, if you come study martial arts with a teacher and let's just, I'm just going to call him a master, right? You go to see a master and you're like, I really want to learn martial arts. And he says, why? Right. And you say, because you want to win the UFC or some fucking egotistical trip. You know, if you don't, you don't show no signs of valuing life. There's a good chance that uh, he's going to either send you, like if it were me, I would usually send you to another instructor. Um, not saying that I would send you to a bad instructor, not intentionally. Right. I would try to send you to someone that I thought would be able to give you what you're looking for. Right. Right. Um, I, I've many times I walked somebody who was interested in sports fighting, like to a judo school, you know, I'm like here, this is a much better fit for you. Right. Or there was a guy uh, I was teaching Kempo to that, uh, was really obsessed with Japanese culture. So I took him to go study with a Kenjitsu professor. Right. So there's just, if, if, you know, there's people out there that do what you're looking for, but I'm not that guy. Right. Right. Don't get me wrong. I can teach Kenjits, but for me, at the time I was teaching Kempo, I wasn't offering Kenjits. In fact, I was learning Kenjits at the time. I wasn't in a position to be teaching it. Um, but okay. all right. So let me let me uh, just bring some of the uh, um, comments and questions. Bagelis Drosos, hello, Master Frank. Happy birthday, sir. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Desmond Bidal, how does one deal with egotistical students, especially if you're progressing by training and hard work? You kill them. No, um, I'm joking. I'm joking. You, <laughs> so uh, Master Frank earlier said, uh, talked about the horse dance, right? I used to do that a lot. I, I have a system where on the first day of class, I can give somebody a horse dance and make the entire class about details on the horse dance. So he spends the entire class, you know, tucking your tailbone, shift your fit, um, you know, it just it's, breathe deeply from your belly, you know, position your feet like this, straighten your back, lower your chin, tongue on the roof. You know, I just, I add all the internal Qigong stuff into the horse stance and I spend the whole class just on the horse stance. I don't teach anything else. Right. And I do that for like, my classes are like anywhere from two to four hours. Try to imagine you walk in on your first day of class and you spend two hours in the horse stance. Right. Then you leave, you know, you limp home. Are you going to come back? That's one way I see if somebody actually really wants to learn or not, you know, like, does he trust me enough to really teach or he's just, you know, he's not sure about me because people that are not sure, I feel like didn't do their homework, but that's my own little pet peeve, right? Like, don't just go to somebody and ask them to learn and you don't know anything about them, right? That means you're going to be poor at gathering intelligence. And that's something I value in somebody. I want students that are hungry and thirsty for knowledge and are willing to put in a little bit of work to get that information. Um, all right. So egotistical students, generally the rule of thumb is, you know, you smash them, right? The rule of thumb is if a student comes in and he's got a huge ego and uh, he's uh, too arrogant to even learn or to teach, then typically you just you fight him. Right. You're like, OK, I'll spar with you. And and you do that. And I generally try to spar with all the people that come to learn from me like day one. Right. So um, I had a guy come in uh, covered in. Well, whatever. I'll save you that story. But generally, that's how you deal with an egotistical student. You humble them. Right. Right. But there are other ways to do it. And as I became older and I became nicer, I started finding, especially, okay, in the military, right? Because when you teach in military, guys, there's a lot of ego, right? Especially officers. And I'm just being real with you. Officers and, uh, you know, if you're doing pilots or you're dealing with certain uh, certain communities, um, they can be really full of themselves, right? They can think that sure. they already know everything there is to know about fighting. So what do you do, right? You just teach. You just teach the art slow and progressive way and they weave themselves out the art itself works that way you know that's why some people used to say you know that it's difficult for someone to attain deadly skills with the martial arts because they'll usually just go find something easier right so if the person is not too much of a distraction he's not too much of a danger to the other students then you can usually let the art in itself if you're patient process it out um he'll, he'll eventually either weed out or he'll change his attitude you know um, if you have a good, um, I call it second in command, if you have a good uh, closed door disciple that you've been training for a while, you know, uh, sometimes you could just pit them against the egotistical student and have the them. Enforcer, right. 
that way you're not, you know, you're not really setting, you know, like you, you remain on that pedestal for the student as somebody they can trust and feel safe around, but they were still humbled. Right. I remember uh, my teacher did this to me. Uh, a guy came, uh, his name is Carlos, uh, Mr. Mendoza. And he came from, I don't know, kind of some kind of special forces thing background. And he, uh, we were doing, I think it was captured twigs, you know, it was a yellow belt. And I guess I might've been arrogant. I'm, I'm not sure, but he put me in a bear hug and then he suplexed me backwards onto my neck. And, uh, you know, it was, it wasn't that it was painful. It wasn't that my neck was hurting. I mean, it was, but that wasn't why I was devastated because my ego was so hurt that right. someone could do that to me, you know? And my teacher played it off. Like, that's just, oh, sorry. That's how we always used to train. You know, like if you don't do the technique fast enough, you get thrown. And uh, so sorry about that, you know, but that was, you know, now when I reflect back on it, I realize what he did, you know, is to let you know, like, there's a huge gap between you and this person and you need to show a certain amount of humility and respect and stuff like that. Right. It was useful in that regard. So what do you do with egotistical students? You can either smash them or let the process weed itself out, or you could try to teach them the values, right? You can talk about Wu Day and how important it is and about humility. And you can give examples of humility um, because all of that uh, comes in there. And, uh, and there's there's other ways to do it. There are certain drills that lend themselves and well to that. You just mentioned something very important. I'm sorry to, to Go ahead, no. interrupt. If you don't interrupt me, my mouth keeps going. Uh, I think that showing uh, the way you carry yourself, becoming an example of that, you just mentioned it, you know, being respectful, being humble, treating people the right way, um, that also helps a lot. I mean, if you are aligned with the way you behave and what you teach, that's truly, truly important. And sometimes you don't see that. Okay. And I want to give two, uh, two examples, but it's going to sound like I'm beating my own drum. I'm not going to name names, but this is very recent, right? Well, in the last few years. So one thing I did was there was a guy that I really liked coming up in the Kempo ranks, right? He had uh, just so much potential, right? And he was really heavy into tournament fighting and he kept winning first place. And uh, I remember back when I was a kid fighting in the tournaments and winning first place and how that made me feel. And I wanted to break him away from that. So since I had already worked with him in private and I had shown him, a, you know, I let him glimpse some of my level, like where I'm actually at he had a lot of respect for me and also because of my past and stuff. So then I went to a tournament with him and I purposely lost. Right. So I fought, I fought in the tournament while he was watching and I let every single contestant in the tournament beat me. You know, I was actually really frustrated because one of them ran into my fist and let me score a point. But, um, and I just had my guard up, but anyway, so that was there. And actually that was witnessed and video recorded. And I hope that video never surfaces, but anyway, so, um, uh, that's that's something that happened um, when I was in Washington. And now another case um, I had, I think I was teaching a seminar or something, and there was a lot of guys that were way more senior than me there. And the subject that I was teaching, I didn't know if they were really good at it or not, because I was teaching a lot of ground, uh, Nawaza, basically. And so I thought I would start the match first. You know, after I taught them the basics, then we were going to roll. So when we got to the rolling part, I went against the white belt and I allowed myself to be defeated. Right. And I was talking the white belt into like what to do. Um, and then I let him beat me. And I don't think anybody was confused that that was uh, that I allowed him to do that. But at the same time, I wanted to, to tell them without telling them, hey, even if you're senior, it's OK to lose to someone junior, you know, because this is all how we learn. This is part of the process. Right. Um, it can be a little you know, dicey when you got like, you know, seventh and eighth degree black belts in there trying to do something that they're not familiar with. And then you you pit them like everybody's a beginner in this topic. And then if they get defeated, they feel like, you know, maybe you embarrassed them or you intentionally did it. So I was, I was a very nervous and self-conscious about that. And I, you know, the person who I'm thinking of now is probably going to know what I'm talking about. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was nervous about that because I didn't want to insult or, or embarrass anybody. I was just trying to teach, but you kind of have to, there's ways to do it and kind of setting an example is definitely one of them. Thank you for, thank you for that. Okay, uh, we have some more comments. Mr. Orman, etiquette is an integral part of martial arts. Respect is given until broken. Um, I know you're going to feel a certain way. Disagree, sir. I think respect should be given always. Now, trust and um, 
admiration, that's another thing. But I think respect should, will, should be given all the time. I think we should always be respectful towards everybody. That's my belief. But thank you for sharing, sir. Thank you very much. But I, I, I think what, what usually gets broken is the admiration and the trust. Or am I wrong? Yeah, I mean, because when you talk about respect and disrespect, you know, disrespect, like uh, like walking into someone's dojo and spitting on the floor, you know, like that kind of blatant disrespect, that's never OK. It's never OK to be disrespectful. And in fact, I used to tell people sometimes and I like to joke about death. So pardon all my jokes. But um, but I would say, you know, um, you can even be respectful while killing somebody. There's no reason to lose your manners. Right. And lose your character and your virtue. Even in the midst of a violent confrontation, you don't have to be disrespectful. I know people are like, well, it's disrespectful because you, you know you're killing him, but it's not. You can respectfully kill something just like you respectfully slaughter an animal, right? There's right. ways to do it, right? And there's ways to be, you know, don't piss on the body after you kill it. Pardon my my directness. Um, and the same idea. So there's, you know, I understand what you're saying is I've heard you say this before, Master Soto, and I I thought a lot about what you said because I was like, can you? Really, just should you just respect people who haven't earned it? But the more I thought about it, it's really more about respecting yourself and respecting yes. who you are, right? You got to respect yes. who you are. And uh, that just by default happens to be a person of higher moral fiber than whoever it is that you feel isn't worthy of respect. And also by giving them the respect, they might just start realizing that there's a respect element at play. And what, what people will lose, definitely lose from you when they you know, abuse the trust is they will lose your trust. I mean, for sure. And your admiration. If you have some type of admiration to the, for that person, right, they might lose that too. But respect shouldn't be lost. I, I believe respect, and, and this is not a concept of mine. You know, I learned this. Okay. Um, so respect, it's something that should be given by default, just because you are human. Because you respect life, you respect others, you respect yourself, you respect your values. That's the way I believe it should be, right? But I could be wrong. I, I mean, but I think what gets broken, it's trust, right? That gets broken for sure. I mean, I'm not going to trust you if I know you're not trustworthy. I'm not stupid, right? But that, because that would put me in a vulnerable and a bad situation. I'm trusting a person who shouldn't be trusted, and I know it shouldn't be trusted, and don't trust the person. But you can still be respectful. Right. right? Now, now there's some kind of a separate thing, but there is that uh, – depends on who you're training. But uh, in some cases, I don't necessarily want the students to trust me completely, okay? Especially if I'm giving private lessons to somebody. I don't want them to feel that, oh, the master's level of control is so good that he would never, you know, you'd never. Let. I want them to be like, well, there's a good possibility he's going to break my nose. You know, like I, I want them to kind of wonder if he has any control at all. I mean, I'm not saying you nail them and you break their ribs, but there should be that level. And that's another actually popular traditional method is to, you know, slap a student in the face while you're doing sticky hands or something and sure. see if uh, the anger flares up and the nose starts flaring and stuff and kind yeah, of but, see, but i'm talking about the, the human relationship type of trust yeah right yeah. i mean if i have a friend and i trust trust my friend or my couple or my partner or whatever and they abuse that trust or they betray me for whatever reason or something right then that trust is going to be lost that's what i'm, I'm very basic stuff right yeah it, let no me, you're let right me. and you shouldn't you shouldn't resort to disrespecting them at that point but exactly. heaven knows it can be hard sometimes you can be the better man the better person right Okay, Usually. Miguel Estrosa says, hello, Master Mervorman. Okay, hello. Uh, Max Dojo Diamond Bar, hello, Mr. Ibrahim and Mr. Soto. Happy belated birthday. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Much appreciated. Salvador Becerra, hello, Master Frank Soto. Also, your social media guest, Sammy Ibrahim. Thank you, sir. Okay, Desmond Vidal asks, and uh, we're running, we are out of time. Uh, does Kempo and Silla have similarities in their kata or movements, etc.? Okay, real quick, last question thing? before I have to go because I got to go pick up my daughter. Yes. But um, but okay, there's no katas in uh in Sila, but they have something called jurus, which are the upper body motions, and then there's lanka, which is the footwork, right? So in the jurus, right, 
you'll have, you know, Jurus that look like this from like, for example, the Chamande system, right? You have various Jurus, right? And it's just the quick upper body motion that doesn't usually utilize the lower body when you're first learning it. That's why sometimes uh, traditionally you might actually start learning Silat while seated, right? It's a lot of forearm conditioning, a lot of basic movements. Now, are those movements found in like, say, Kempo, right? Do we have a movement where we might roll and strike and rip back out? Um, in a way we do, right? We have motions where we, we do covering blocks, right? It, it might look a little bit different from um, the actual C-lot, but we have very similar movements and very similar uh, uh, methods of generating power, right? There's there's some cross pollination there. Okay. Um, the Lanka is also similar. We have 45 degree stepping or what they call triangle stepping. Um, we have very similar sweeps like so Sapu, Front leg sweeps and uh, excuse me, uh, beset and sapu um, are part of kempo under different names, right? And we have those when we're stepping into our twist stances and things like that. Um, so there's similarities in movements and there's similarities in some of the weapon stuff, but not all of it, right? And it um, if the way they train is a different, it's a different pyramid, it's a different structure, if you will, of progression. You're learning things a little bit differently. You can teach Kempo in a Silat way, right? But you generally can't teach Silat in a Kempo way. Um, and uh, I'll talk about that more the next time I'm on the show. I really got to go. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care. Everybody be safe. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Take care and have a great day. Okay. I'm going to close it up now. Thanks. Okay. So. Uh, Maestro Sean Kelly says, as martial humans, we set the example first. Yes, thank you, sir. As for trust, you allow who you wish to share it with. Once one becomes at a level of proficiency, then it is we who sets the example. Gracias. Thank you for an awesome topic and sharing wisdom. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your comments. Much appreciated. You're the man. Okay, so uh, thank you, everybody that watched the show today. This was great. Thanks to Mr. Ibrahim. Uh, and uh, everybody, take care and have a great day. See you later. Bye-bye.